uh, uh, thank you for coming to our meeting today. Sorry for the inconveniences, but as usual, there's people that know how to fig how to get things fixed. Uh, you saw the slide going on and off. Uh, Dr. Paul Dotto uh, will be speaking with us today, and uh, we'll go on next here. Uh, so. Uh, Uh, the principles of our meeting, most of you know, but raise your hand as we go around. Bill, Bill Lewis, our president, he's outside setting up the lunch, I think. That next, next guy is me, believe it or not. Uh, next one, Steve Pendergast, he's the secretary and does the newsletter. Uh, Bill Manning, does uh, he's our videographer. Uh, Aaron Lamb, unfortunately, is, uh, is the one who's uh, having an issue with his daughter in the hospital. And then John Tassie, we always mention him. He's retired, and, and, uh, but he still takes care of our website for us. And then uh, there's you people. And uh, everyone is a volunteer, and uh, if you have ways you could help us out, we'd appreciate it. Volunteer, if you would, please. All you newcomers were given a form when you came, hope. Anybody that came in and did not get uh, a newcomer form, uh, please fill out the top. You did not get, <laughs> you're far from being a newcomer. Oh, you got him. You got him there. Uh, be sure to hand in the uh, top sheet to us. Just lay it here at the dais when, when the meeting's over, if you would, please. Uh, uh, it has an information kit with the d information that help you out, and uh, uh, either Bill Lewis or I will be contacting you next week to find out if you can fill you in with any other information. Uh, we always do a treatment survey, and always uh, uh, good to know what people are going through. So when we uh, end the meeting, you can. Uh, circulate and talk to people and learn about different ways to help you along. Uh, how many of here are on active surveillance? This is good, this is good, okay. Uh, how many have had surgery? Uh, my hand will be raised for every one of them, okay. Uh, how many have had radiation? Uh, How many had proton? Aha, uh -huh. okay, that's good. Uh, how many are on ADT hormone therapy? Lots and lots and lots. Uh, oh, chemotherapy. Okay. Uh, some of the newer treatments of focal HIFU, laser, or cryo, and you had any of those new ones? Okay. Uh, immunotherapy, Provenge. Good, 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 good. Took me a long time for my doctor to convince me I had something to gain by doing that. Uh, so, but it, uh, obviously I'm still looking at you, so it did help. Uh, how many had Zofigo? Zofigo? Hmm. Fluvicto. The brand new treatment. You're doing that now, Larry? Good, good, good. Is Jim Duvall here? Okay. I know he was one of the first ones that, in it, and uh, I'll be going Monday for my fourth treatment. Uh, uh, how many have suffered recurrence? Quite likely many of you. Okay. And how many are undecided about future? <laughs> That's for sure. Uh oh. Uh, yeah, we need help and uh, help us uh, uh, find new speakers. So, uh, and also we uh, every three or four months we uh, uh, do a meeting where some of uh, people people talk about their experiences. So that's good. So there's a there's our contact information if you'd like to uh, participate in uh, telling your story to the, everybody. Uh, now, one of the main messages of our group is uh, uh, we share the patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager. 
through infor informing, networking, and caring. Uh, uh, we're a group of experienced participants, but we are not medical professor professionals, and then sharing by our group could not be substituted for medical information. We are a 501c3 profit, nonprofit organization. Your donations are tax deductible. Uh, uh, no uh, medical or religious affiliations. Uh, our, our largest costs are website. Uh, we don't do the advertising in the newspaper anymore because it's not getting any attention. And I occasionally make mailings. So please make a donation. Where's the baskets? Here we go. So I'll start on that. And uh, anytime you want to make a do uh, donation, there's the address, the IPCS PO Box 42014 and 92142. I check that two or three times a week. Oh, I did, I did get the next one. I just verified with Dr. Lamb yesterday. He for sure will be here uh, April 15th. Uh, he speaks to us almost every year. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging in there with us all to, this morning. I'm Paul Dotto. I'm uh, part of uh, Unio Healthcare uh, uh, Health Partners, um, largest private practice urology group in San Diego. Um, I'm the medical director for our prostate cancer center, um, soon to advance to comprehensive cancer uh, center uh, with the advent of uh, bladder cancer uh, therapeutics. So it's nice to be back with you here. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here. Uh, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I noticed that there was no fruit basket out in front, so you guys aren't, aren't ready to start throwing anything at me. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Um, what uh, Bill Lewis uh, asked me to give this presentation on uh, new prostate cancer tests, and he kindly actually g gave me a whole list of, of uh, potentials, uh, 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 testings that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through. So there's a lot of information that I'm going to present, uh, and you'll see that information there, and hopefully it's, it'll be helpful for you, and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. So when we, when we look at prostate cancer, I think this is really the pathway and the choices that we really currently have available. Um, we have, and you can really really break down the testing into, into different buckets, right? We can do um, uh, testing for, for screening before the diagnosis is made. We have testing with regards to um, uh, performance uh, prior to a, a, a um, uh, after the first biopsy, after consideration for a second biopsy, uh, we also have them for prior to th uh, therapeutics or, or treatment once the diagnosis has been made. Uh, we have them post-treatment. Uh, we have those with a negative biopsy, and we also uh, have some potentials for active surveillance, actually. I think that's an area we're going to talk about at the end that's an un unmet need at this moment in time. <laughs> And so we're going to go through all these different areas and, and take them um, bucket by bucket, so give you a little bit of an idea of what we're kind of dealing with. And really overarching all of this is really uh, multiparametric MRI as well as PSMA PET-CT. Um, you're familiar with these. Um, we have different indications, and when it comes to indications, it comes to insurance coverage. Uh, for all of these tests, including MRI and PET-CT, what's, what's approved, what isn't, what's going to be covered, and what isn't. And we run into that all the time. Uh, we do have financial toxicity, not only in our therapeutics for our patients, but also in terms of, of therapies. And it's all based on what the insurance plan and what they allow and what they don't allow. So PSA, you're all familiar with it. It's been around a long time. I do believe it's going to be around for a much longer period of time. Um, it's not going to go away. We're still, use, we're still using it. It remains a relatively inexpensive test as compared to all the others that I'm going to present to you today. Um, we know that it has uh, value. We know that the PSA level below the median has strong negative predictive value for meaningful cancer. I'm sorry it doesn't project terribly well, but we can see Here is the 50th percentile, so that's the median, right? PSA is lower, 50% uh, lower, 50% that are higher. 
And we can actually look at that and use that as a very good guideline as an initial read on the PSA and an, an interpretation. Uh, I think we've all become accustomed to a PSA level of 4.0. Everything is based on that. Whether we do something we don't, you're below, you're fine, you're above it, you're, you're not. And it's really not that simple, unfortunately. Um, the, the median PSA is actually, when you look at it, and you look at it based on um, age, which is really what PSA varies by, uh, you, we probably should be looking at that threshold of PSA actually closer to about one, and even less, and certainly less than one, the younger you are. So again, remains, and remains helpful, it's been validated across multiple, multiple studies since its inception and since we've been using it since the 1980s. Uh, so it remains a great test, but it certainly has some, uh, some deficiencies, okay? So we can look at early PSA testing really as, um, as a baseline in, for initial screening, but we really need to move beyond that into secondary screening. Uh, if it appears to be abnormal, we really need additional information and not base our decisions on PSA alone. And uh, we have certainly come a long way. There are uh, multivariable calculators that have clearly um, uh, made PSA much more uh, useful. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of those uh, as well today. We have a multiparametric MRI, we've got biomarkers, and that's principally what I'll be going over today. And of course, PSA density, and that, and that, is, a, that is a great help. So uh, the guidelines really uh, recommend uh, a discussion and really a, a shared decision-making process between physician and patient. That's really uh, Im important. Uh, that's really important before you even do the PSA testing. Uh, it certainly is important after the test is, is performed. It is still our chief test to evaluate uh, patients uh, after the diagnosis has been made and certainly after uh, therapy has been, has been given. Um, um, that's still our key indicator uh, whether we are going, if we need additional um, uh, imaging, we need additional testing. Uh, so it is still very, uh, very important under those circumstances. Um, and as you all are aware, uh, since the uh, United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendations came out, uh, we have seen, unfortunately, a significant, and I really say tremendous, increase uh, in patients presenting with advanced disease, with metastatic disease, and we can really tie prostate cancer mortality directly to the time when that um, uh, recommendation came out. Um, uh, as, uh, if I'm going to stand here on my, on my soapbox here and pontificate a little bit, uh, I think the issue has really come into where it's been used and really hasn't been used through the primary care physicians where they stopped using that. They took the recommendations from the task force to heart, and that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. It's taken some time for it to show up. The task force did come back after their initial D recommendation and uh, gave it a C, but I still think that's too, quite too low. Um, and um, unfortunately, our patients are the ones who are um, suffering as a result of it. So here's some of the multivariable uh, calculators that are available. Uh, the PCPT, which is kind of, which is really nice. It's quite visual. Um, has these smiley faces. Um, we plug in different characteristics into that, different information, uh, things like, um, like age um, and a number of other parameters will actually give us a risk of prostate cancer if a, if a biopsy is performed. So I think that's helpful for the patient to be able to see that, um, especially on these borderline PSA elevations to say, should we or should we not? Is the patient really open to having uh, a biopsy performed? The Europeans under uh, the uh, ERSPC also, they have a number of risk calculators. They have a general, they have a general health uh, calculator, PSA risk calculator, a um, number of other ones here. Actually, they have six total here that are here. So I don't use that too much. I've used the PCPT. I think, again, it's helpful at the point of care within the office if we have, we're having that discussion, should we or should we not proceed to a biopsy? And this, again, is going to be an aid to help to interpret that PSA level uh, much more so. As another example here in terms of looking at that baseline screening PSA, this is the UCSF primary care model that they've actually uh, adopted. Uh, you can see here with a PSA a age of uh, 45 to 60, the PSA is less than one. They don't recheck it again for at least five years. If it's one to two, they'll recheck in six to 12 uh, months. Um, if there are other parameters, oh, thank you so much, I appreciate that. 
If there are other, other uh, factors that come into play, such as family history, um, there's obviously anxiety that comes into play for patients, um, that they'll, be, they'll then make the referral uh, to the urologist. If the level is over two, the referral is then, is then made. Uh, as we get into the next decades of life, the 61 to 75, again, still that less than one, your risk of having significant high-risk uh, prostate cancer, high-grade cancer, is so low that they'll not recheck it again for five years. And if it's in the one to three range, again, it's a six to 12-month um, uh, um, uh, recheck. Again, factors are going to uh, adjust that in terms of an earlier referral. Uh, and if it's over three, that's when the referral then is, is performed. Still under screening um, is this um, idea of polygenic risk score. This is based on single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is the most common genetic uh, variation um, among people. That's what, really what makes us different from one another. Um, uh, these are just differences in single nucleotides, which of course the, is the material that makes up DNA, um, our genetic code. Um, and um, these um, uh, variations occur both within genes and then in between genes, what we consider coding and non-coding segments um, of the DNA. And so it represents really the, uh, the sum total of genetic variants that an individual has, and that's how we assess their uh, risk for developing um, a particular disease, in this case, prostate cancer. Um, it measures the burden of risk-associated uh, SNPs uh, when you get a score. Uh, there was one that was available. It was called the PROMPT test. Um, it, um, I thought, was very helpful. We actually beta tested it in, within our group. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you for, uh, anecdotally that there were several individuals as a result of having high scores led them to uh, pursue a evaluation they were found to have prostate cancer. So uh, unfortunately, um, the original company that uh, developed it and, uh, was sold to Invite, and they have not seen fit to market it, so it's not currently available, but I think it's, it's an interesting um, um, test that perhaps may come along in time again for us. Um, you've heard of PCA3. Again, we're still under screening here. It was originally approved uh, simply for a prior negative biopsy. So one biopsy was negative. What's my chance that we miss something? We perform the PCA3 um, and see if the, if the risk um, was sufficient enough to repeat the biopsy. Uh, certainly improved specificity over PSA, which is fairly low, but it was dependent upon the threshold. Uh, and so um, with additional evaluation, what they found is that if you were on either end of the threshold, you were low or high, it gave you some meaningful information. So it had good negative predictive value uh, at a low threshold with a score of less than 20. It was good positive predictive value above the threshold of 60, but when you're in between, it really didn't, get, didn't really help you too much. It uh, was not a, a strong pre, um, predictor and it went a consistent one for high-grade disease. And therefore, it has really sort of fallen out of use as an individual or standalone test, but it has been incorporated into other tests. 4K score, which is uh, analyzing total PSA, uh, your free PSA, intact PSA, and human calicrun uh, number two. Um, it includes uh, clinical factors. So we're looking at age, previous biopsy, digital examination findings. Contraindications are with a uh, digital exam within 96 hours, certainly history of uh, prostate cancer use, because this is still a screening test with no prior history. Um, if, they've, if you've used something like finasteride or dutasteride within six months, and then if there's been a surgical procedure on the prostate within the preceding six months. So this actually has a continuous type of, uh, of risk assessment. Uh, low, median, high, so we're going to get different scores on the basis, and therefore uh, uh, you can assess your risk based on what your risk tolerance is. So you can look at somebody and say, well, my risk tolerance is, is pretty low. The, the test has given me a value that may be o over the threshold, which is typically set at 7.5 percent. Someone may accept a higher risk threshold, so you can actually use that to help guide uh, decisions. 
So intermediate risk would be between 7.5 and 19.9, and then the high risk uh, is going to be greater than or equal to 20 percent. Sensitivity is quite high at, at uh, 94 percent, and the negative predictive value for Gleason grade group two or higher is 95 percent at the 7.5 percent. Uh, cut off, and this is this is the report, and this is what it looks like. So it's it's quite visual, and uh, something again that you, I can go over with my patients and be able to demonstrate to them where they actually lie, lie on the spectrum and help make that decision. Uh, we have XODX, uh, which is relatively new. XODX is a urine-based um, study that's based on exosomes. Exosomes are, are, uh, are little vesicles, um, uh, little packets of fluid uh, that uh, contain really a, a cross-section of what the intracellular uh, material is, uh, and it's really going to represent that. Um, we're looking here, again, here's PCA3 that's been incorporated into a newer test along with the Temper SS2 ERG fusion. So we're looking at the MR, mRNA of that. And so it's giving you a, mole a molecular signature uh, that would be predictive of prostate cancer. Nice thing about this is that you don't need to go through a DRE. Uh, they did have a home test. Uh, many of us used those during COVID lockdown when patients couldn't get in. So we're able to get their testing done. Um, it's really had uh, significant validation over 1,000 patients. There's at least two validation trials to, to, to risk stratify for Gleason grade 2 or above uh, versus low grade uh, Gleason group 1 and benign disease. So the pre uh, negative predictive value is quite high at 91% with a uh, low positive predictive value, sensitivity 92%, specificity low at 34%. Probably one of the most uh, common used um, um, in um, tests in our group, at least in my office, for, for my patients just because of ease of use and we don't have to worry about the DRE, which is never comfortable. Um, PHI, Prostate Health Index, um, uh, approved in 2012. Um, this is a, a, a calculation for the pro-PSA, pro-2-PSA divided by the free PSA and it's multiplied by the square root of the total PSA. Uh, not something that I run in my office, thank you, they run the test for us. Um, indicated for uh, men over the age of 50 with a non-suspicious DRE. Uh, so uh, if you do staging, it's going to be a T1C uh, prostate exam and PSAs in the range of 4 to 10. Um, it has a better negative predictive value, uh, um, uh, but a relatively low specificity and uh, positive predictive value. Um, uh, what we see here is, uh, at least in this particular study, total PSA negative predictive value was like 75%. Uh, uh, PHI was 88.9. Uh, its positive predictive value and specificity uh, were pretty low. Um, it also suffered, at least initially, from uh, the uh, blood draw, because this is blood-based, um, requiring special laboratory to do it. It's now become available uh, in at point of care within the offices, uh, but uh, um, from a personal perspective, we haven't adopted it into, into at least my, my particular office. Select MDX is another urine-based uh, test. It's using MRA transcripts, different than XODX. It's using Hox. Uh, C6 and DLX1, and it does require a DRE, and it's not simply a DRE, but it actually requires a bit of a prostate massage, so there is some um, uncomfortableness with it, I'll put it that way. Sensitivity, um, uh, fairly low at 76%, negative predictive value, 82%, and this is all for Gleason uh, score of 7 or higher. Uh, if you uh, compare the sensitivity of it, uh, it really wasn't different than using the uh, European um, calculator and, and digital examination or MRI. Um, if you included um, select MDX along with M MRI, you actually improve that negative predictive value up to 93%. So uh, this test, as many of the others that I'm, I'm reporting on today, really are calibrated to the negative predictive value, right? It's to be able to say, um, I'm not really so interested in low-grade cancer um, because that's not a risk to the individual, but the high-grade cancer is. I want to know, is there something there that I need to go after? I need to do something more about 
uh, to warrant uh, the, 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 the side effects of discomfort and infection with a biopsy. We want to know that information, who needs it, who doesn't. Um, the um, uh, negative predictive value at uh, 90% uh, um, uh, is at 90% rather for um, a Gleason um, greater than or equal to 7. Um, you, um, uh, you see that the PHI score negative predictive value for any cancer, that's the top um, chart, uh, is uh, quite low at 45%, uh, but in this particular study it was 79% for high-grade uh, high cancers. Um, uh, that's, that's for PHI, this is, and this then uh, compared it to select MDX uh, for negative predictive value was 31% uh, across uh, all cancers and increased to 90% for the high-grade cancer. So you can see here that we make, uh, uh, some of these are going to be better for what we're looking for, and that's how we make our selections as to which one we should be using. My prostate score, um, now updated to version 2.0, actually was developed uh, as the Michigan prostate score originally. Um, this is kind of probably the newest one on the block. Um, it it's, uh, combines PCA3. Again, we're seeing PCA3 being combined in, in newer studies. Now with multiple markers, uh, you've got the temper uh, um, uh, e ERG fusion gene along with all these other ones uh, that I, I won't uh, list for you that you can see there. Um, it does require a digital exam with a massage. Um, application uh, was actually suggested prior to a second biopsy with a, with a threshold of 15 on its score. Uh, was 100% sensitive for Gleason grade uh, 2 or higher. Um, it's actually very nice to be able to read. I've used this several times uh, for my patients. It's, I think it's provided good information. It's actually the, lower, the earlier study that I used, not the, not the 2.0. Um, I found it really quite helpful. The patients did as well. It's a nice little gas gauge um, um, image here that I think uh, uh, helps interpretation much better. Uh, and um, uh, there, we're not seeing any differences in race here. So for African-American men versus Caucasian men, we're seeing uh, good validation from, from that standpoint and uh, really uh, missing a small percentage of, of high-grade cancer, which is really what you want in a study. Confirm MDX, uh, a little different. We're not using it for screening, but we're actually using it for uh, circumstances where we have a negative uh, biopsy and we want to know, did we miss something? Um, is there still a chance of malignancy that was not picked up? And it's really an epigenetic test. Uh, uh, epigenetics is where we look at um, uh, not changes in the gene themselves, but in the environment of the gene that actually changes its expression. So these are going to be additions of things like methylation groups and other changes in the, in, around the DNA that leads to a different outcome in terms of what that gene is, is typically producing. So um, um, it is a reversible process with epigenetics. It's one way the, the, the cell controls itself uh, uh, in terms of reading its genes. Uh, again, I said, as I said, it analyzes uh, negative biopsies um, for the tumor-associated DNA. It's actually looking at methylation in this case. Um, it actually looks at tissue adjacent to an area of tumor uh, that may have been missed to look for these changes and indicate, therefore, that there's a greater likelihood um, that uh, there is um, uh, something present um, uh, for malignancy, reducing the false negative rates, uh, which is really what a biopsy does if it, if it, misses, uh, if it misses cancer. That would be considered a false negative. You didn't pick it up. Um, um, it, uh, it uses uh, these uh, tumor suppressor genes, GSTP1, APC, and uh, RASF1. Uh, negative predictive value, 96%, um, and um, uh, it um, uh, definitely was higher uh, in, uh, with regards to uh, methylation, to the degree of methylation in higher grade cancer than lower grade cancer. And again, comes up, you come up with a very nice um, grid here where all your biopsies are shown uh, and it'll tell you where the methylation was positive so that when you go back and do a biopsy, uh, you can concentrate on that particular area and do a more focal biopsy. Just a quick word on serum uh, calicrins. Um, um, the only serum calicrin that we actually use 
individually uh, is really uh, human calocrin-3, that's PSA, that's what we know as PSA. There's certainly two other ones that are produced in the prostate. They're all regulated by the androgen receptor pathway, uh, and uh, um, they, they have been incorporated principally into other tests other than PSA as human calocrin-3. All right, let's take a look at some of these hits and misses. Again, this is a, a list that Bill gave me uh, that I want to go through that with you. PAP, prostatic acid phosphatase. Um, I've been in practice for 31 years. This is the first one that I had used to since I started my residency before PSA became available. So it really was the cl first clinically useful um, uh, marker, and you can date this back to the original report from uh, Huggins and Hodges, the University of Chicago, uh, which um, reported on the effect of um, essentially hormonal manipulation, either through castration or estrogens, on metastatic prostate cancer. And probably the first study that ever used a marker to evaluate. Um, if you go back and look at the original study, there are about 12 men uh, where they uh, provided either estrogens or castration. Uh, and they measured what, at that, at that time, they called it a, an, an acid phosphatase. We, knew it was, uh, we now know it was prostatic acid phosphatase. And you saw the marker decrease. And they actually then re-challenged men with a testosterone preparation, which we could never do now because these were all men with metastatic disease. They re-challenged them and actually saw the acid phosphatase go back up again. So this was the first one that was, uh, that was useful. Again, into the 1980s, we were still using it really been supplanted by PSA um, uh, for screening that we talked about, monitoring response to therapy. Um, there has been suggested as a prognostic factor uh, for intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer. Uh, the ratio of PSA to PAP perhaps as a, as a, um, 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 as a way to be able to uh, give us information uh, on that. Uh, really not commonly used. A um, uh, few people still use that, uh, but again, as I said, it's been pretty well supplanted just by PSA. So we'll leave it to historical record principally. Early prostate cancer antigen, EPCA, uh, it's a nuclear matrix uh, protein. Uh, correlation uh, with elevated levels, uh, at least in one study, showed um, uh, poor prognosis, uh, but uh, several other studies really didn't uh, bear that out. Um, it could be, have been related to the way the assay was done. Um, there was a different expression, whether you were looking at it in blood or in tissue. Um, so it really has not uh, been useful. Uh, there was a second marker called EPCA2, simply was the second one that was identified. Uh, and unfortunately, as sometimes happens, unfortunately, I think we're seeing that more nowadays, the, the paper that described it was retracted because the data was not verifiable. GSTP1 methylation, I, refu I, I, um, I referred to that uh, in the CONFIRM MDX trial. Um, it's, a co it's a gene that codes for uh, proteins that are involved in cell cycle regulation and detoxification. Um, very highly expressed in basal and luminal cells, but not in malignant cells. Uh, and so we talked again, again, this methylation issue frequently associated with tumor development and poor prognosis, and perhaps that it could identify uh, prostate cancer development. Um, they looked at it from histo histology, that is, as a stain uh, for, for tissue, uh, but because it's also present in um, pre-neoplastic or, 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 or um, Precancerous changes, it really wasn't very, it wasn't quite reliable. So as a standalone, it doesn't really uh, work well. But as I said, it's been incorporated uh, into the confirmed MDX. A-methyl acryl co uh, racemase uh, is a, is an enzyme uh, within the mitochondria and, and, and peroxisomes. Really, again, as an enzyme responsible for breakdown of fatty acids, toxins, and other substances. Been, it's been found to be overexpressed in prostate cancer and low expression in normal tissues, really currently being used in, um, uh, in uh, histopathology, immunohistochemical analysis uh, for pathology samples, not as a standalone for evaluation uh, um, uh, for, uh, as a marker, a biomarker for prostate cancer. Uh, and uh, N-methylglycine or sarcosine, um, it's an amino acid. It's, it does, is not used for forming proteins. It's been a proposed marker for prostate cancer, 
Um, the testing has been problematic due to the expense of the equipment, high analytical demands, low concentrations, hasn't really been found to be a practical value. Insulin-like growth uh, factor binding protein, um, uh, it's a metastasis suppression, uh, suppression gene. Um, it um, fosters uh, apoptosis and uh, anti-angiogenesis, -an -an uh, which is the formation in new blood vessels. Uh, studies have suggested a lower level that could be associated with a higher uh, 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 or a greater risk of aggressive disease. Uh, and um, it is used, but it really is to uh, currently for assessing growth hormone production, especially in, in, in children and adolescents. So not as a form yet uh, in terms of prostate cancer available for that. PSP94, it's a secretory protein. Um, it's been, uh, been found to be down-regulated down or negative in 40 50% of prostate cancer samples. Uh, at least in one study, the loss of expression seems to correlate with a higher Gleason grade, advanced stage, and nodal metastasis. Uh, if you combine that loss with P10 loss, uh, it provided some independent prognostic information, still looking at it as a potential marker, but not currently available, uh, certainly commercially, uh, probably only in clinical trials. Um, um, uh, IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine expressed in prostate uh, cancer, um, regulates proliferation, apoptosis, the angiogenesis, and the, di and the differentiation, uh, possibly a fact, uh, working as a growth factor for antigen-independent cell lines, certainly elevated levels in untreated metastatic prostate cancer, hormone-sensitive, and CRPC as well. Um, it, it's uh, it's uh, in, inhibition with an anti-IL-6 um, antibody seems to sensitize antigen-independent prostate cancer cells uh, to, chemotherape uh, to chemotherapeutic agents in vitro. So here we have a situation that, we're, that these cells that are already antigen-independent uh, maybe become more sensitive to the effects of chemotherapy. Uh, there's some evidence that it does play a major role in the transition of hormone-sensitive uh, prostate cancer uh, to CRPC, uh, and that works through the activation of the antigen receptor itself. Uh, and so there has been some effort to find an a, a, a monoclonal antibody against it, uh, um, but results have been mixed, and therefore it hasn't yet been proven to, to have practical application. Serum antibodies have been proposed as a screening test. Uh, it's based on the identification of antibodies against certain cancer antigens, including P53 and Amacur. Um, again, hasn't been proven to be successful, possibly a role in clinical um, um, uh, research uh, in terms of therapies that uh, modulate the immune response. Neuroendocrine markers, um, these would be markers that look at neuroendocrine differentiation, uh, principally for histologic evaluation, so they are used, again, in pathology, first and foremost. Um, there certainly are a subset of patients that have AR-independent biology, where we have this de-differentiation into a, a, what we would call a small cell or a neuroendocrine variant. Um, these, unfortunately, are incredibly aggressive tumors. Um, they usually are going to show up with very extensive disease, typically visceral metastases. Because they are so poorly differentiated, they don't make PSA. Uh, so um, that's kind of a clue. If we see radiographic progression and low PSA, um, we have to really think about that maybe this is undergoing this differentiation into this neuroendocrine or small cell variant. Um, and there really isn't a marker um, in serum uh, that can identify that. We make that principally on, on histology, uh, first and foremost, and obviously the clinical characteristics that gives a clue that this might be going on. Um, you see here that we, you know, it, that it's associated with lytic bone lesions. Um, most prostate cancer forms we call blastic or sclerotic bone lesions. Uh, this forms lytic, so we're seeing bony destruction. That can also give us a clue uh, from that standpoint. Um, chemotherapeutic agents, for example, for neuroendocrine differentiation actually turns to the platinum um, variety of chemotherapy and not the docetaxel or the carbacetaxel that we use for uh, better differentiated tumors. All right, so I've gone through a lot of these tests. So how, how do we use them? Where are we using them? Um, and it really is a, a bit of a conundrum for us. 
Um, you know, we're, we are still using PSA, and a, lot of and a lot of times we're just using PSA alone, but we recognize that it does have some deficiencies. Um, certainly has, has led in the past to um, uh, overdiagnosis, unnecessary biopsies. Um, and um, uh, we do know, of course, that um, it can lead to a lot of anxiety, uh, a little bit of gallows humor. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before, uh, but PSA stands for Patient Physician Stimulated Anxiety. And it certainly does uh, every single time. When I come in, I see a patient in the room, you know, so often they don't want to, you know, how are you, how are you doing, no, what's my PSA? That's the first thing that people want to know. And I get it, and I understand it. So many times, not to be, um, um, uh, not being kind, but I'll say, here's your PSA, you're doing great, now let's talk. So we go through the information, right? We talked about the PSA below the median having a strong predictive, um, uh, negative predictive value for meaningful cancer. Um, again, we come back to the say, how do we augment PSA? We've got it, we use it, it's inexpensive, it's readily available, how can we make this, uh, make this better? So we, 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 you want to take a look at that and say, fine, we've got these multivariable um, calculators, those have been a help, we've got all these other tests, how do we put them together? We want to find this balance between identifying this higher risk, higher grade disease that poses problem, potential problems for our patient. We also want to try to find that balance between biopsies that don't need to be done because we know there are potential risks and complications with biopsies, finding who needs treatment, who doesn't, who needs evaluation, who doesn't. Uh, we've looked here at these biomarkers. Um, we have pretty, pretty high negative predictive value for them, certainly for Gleason grade two. Um, we have MRI. Uh, I'm not here to, to, to give you a discussion and a lecture uh, on MRI. We've got far better people in the, in the community to be able to do that. We can look at MRI and look at its negative predictive value. Uh, it was fairly low at about 76%, and that was based on template biopsy only. Um, we certainly have here in San Diego, um, who I think, that's, I think he's, a, he's a leader, that's Ross Schwartzberg with IHS and the techniques that he uses with his, uh, with his MRI, uh, including respective uh, RSI, and now they have an on-Q AI program that works with that. So his negative predictive value is probably up in, in around the mid-80s from that standpoint. You don't get that from every place you get an MRI at, and I can tell you that. Trying to read MRIs from other facilities, and I'm not gonna mention any names, are very, very difficult and since we do uh, fusion biopsies with MRI in my office, you know, if I, do, if I get an MRI from some other location other than IHS, it's a, it's a challenge to be able to both read the reports as well as look at those images, which don't always uh, come over on a disk that I can actually load into our fusion uh, biopsy software platform. So, um, I, you know, again, uh, I, I'm not here to be a cheerleader for, for IHS and, and Ross, but he, he, they really do a fantastic job. Um, what you also see among other facilities, and this has been, this has been demonstrated, is that there's, there's this huge amount of inter-observer um, uh, variability. What one individual does, and we'll, we'll call a PIRADS-5 uh, or a 4 or a 3, it is actually going to be some, somewhat different and significantly so. Uh, so you want to have a location where you get your studies done that you, you trust the information that's coming to you and you have access to them to be able to review them with you. And I certainly have that with IHS. So that's my plug for them. If you look here at some information, um, and, and what we're looking here is at uh, uh, several biomarkers, uh, what the percent of the avoided biopsies that they were able to provide uh, with their assessment as well as how much high-grade cancer that they missed. So you can look here at the top at 4K in this particular report. This came from ASCO, 14.2% avoided biopsies and 5 point, uh, 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 but 5 percent missed uh, high-grade cancer. Um, and so XODX, 19 versus 4.35, I mean, clearly those are nice, low, missed, uh, high-grade cancers, okay? But you're not avoiding a heck of a lot of biopsies here, okay? Can we do better from that standpoint? Select MDX, very, you know, you've avoided almost 50% of the biopsies, but you're missing a lot of high-grade cancer from here, right? Um, uh, even PIRADS uh, 4 and 5, you're, 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 you're actually looking at, you know, avoiding, again, 50% of biopsies, but high number of missed um, high-grade cancers. So when you start then putting together some of, of, of these 
um, uh, markers along with imaging, we start to get a little bit better uh, and um, be able to both have a, uh, a high number of avoided biopsies and a low percentage of missed uh, prostate cancer. So this really comes down to an algorithm. What algorithm is best? Should we uh, be doing an MRI for any PSA that's outside the range and then go ahead right to biopsy? So we base it on MRI only. Should we base it on MR in a biomarker only? Should we be doing this sequentially? So we check a PSA, we then check an, a biomarker. Uh, if it meets a certain threshold, then we should do the MRI. If that meets a threshold, then go to biopsy. You can see all from that standpoint that we're really not certain yet. We don't have good validated data to say which is the best. So until we have that, we could probably say these are, all not, uh, th these are not all unreasonable. Certainly, we're not basing it on PSA alone. But more work needs to be done. Um, this, uh, this comes from uh, Della Calle at, uh, at UCSF. This is a retrospective study where they actually uh, looked uh, in, a, in, in really in a deep dive into multiple combinations as well as actually providing algorithms for um, uh, 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 evaluation uh, moving on to biopsy. Um, uh, again, you really want to have a high percentage, so you want to have really a long bar, if you will, over there on the biopsies avoided, and you want to have a small bar over here on the missed high-grade cancers. So if, you, we, if we look at, let, we've just taken a, a, an example of algorithm four, that used XODX, and I know you can't see that on the bottom it's, unless you're in the front row, but what they did with algorithm four is that um, they looked at an XODX uh, uh, score uh, if it was less than their threshold, which for XODX is 15.6. If you looked at that, you, have, uh, um, you, uh, you would avoid a biopsy and you would avoid an MRI. You would do an MRI if your XODX score was between 15 and 19, okay? Um, and then only do, and then you would do a biopsy if the MRI was, uh, was abnormal, and then they also um, uh, looked at um, uh, doing MRI and biopsy if the XODX was over 19, okay? So you raise the threshold from 15, which is their initial cutoff. You went a little bit higher from that standpoint. So what you saw here is that you avoided 43% of the biopsies, and, and you only missed about 5% of the high-grade cancers. There's some balance here to be struck, right? Now, nobody wants to be in the situation that you missed my high-grade cancer, right? You prefer it to be, uh, you prefer it to be zero. But again, you've got risk with, uh, with, with doing a lot of biopsies. If you biopsied every single individual, you'd find a lot of high-grade cancer, but now you're exposing men to these risks. Where is that balance? Where is that cut point still to be found? It's, um, it needs to be validated. You need to have a prospective trial. This was retrospective. So we take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it really leads us to start to think, what do we need to do next and how do we need to go forward? Looking at after the diagnosis, we're looking at tissue and blood-based um, uh, genomics. Um, we really have uh, Prolaris, and we have about three, uh, three um, biomarkers or uh, tests that we can run. Prolaris, which is a gene expression assay, it uh, looks at 31 cell cycle progression genes, genes that are involved in really how much the, the, uh, the cell is turned on, and then they uh, compare that to 15 housekeeping genes been validated for uh, disease-specific mortality, distant metastases at a 10-year risk, and its ability to help prevent men with high-risk disease who will benefit from hormonal therapy, um, and which patients with lower-risk cancer can avoid uh, uh, ADT and other, and other therapeutics. Um, it does also utilize clinical data through the CAPRA um, 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 calculator. Uh, so uh, I think it provides some, uh, some additional information here and benefit bringing the clinical data in and not just a raw score that you get. Oncotype DX, the genome progression um, or, um, a score uh, based on uh, 17 genes uh, and their expression. Um, those genes are really related to the four pathways that are known to be involved in cancer, prostate cancer uh, progression. So we're going to look at cellular organization, stromal expression, the antigen pathway, and the proliferation uh, of the cells. Uh, it's been validated as a strong uh, prognostic indicator of adverse pathology, biochemical recurrence, distant METs, and prostate cancer-related death in men uh, with localized prostate cancer after radical prostatectomy. Uh, the assay at least has been shown uh, to be a strong independent prognostic indicator uh, of time to biochemical recurrence, 
um, um, distant metastases and prostate cancer death in men with localized prostate cancer undergoing radiation therapy. So we have two for radical prostatectomy and we have then also for radiation therapy. The Cypher uh, is a 22 gene panel. Um, it's a genomic classifier, and also a prediction model for metastasis, just as the other two are. Uh, it looks at protein coding and non-coding, uh, RNA, uh, cell proliferation, cell cycle progression, immune response, structure, uh, motility, and cell adhesion. It's been validated as a predictor for metastasis and prostate cancer specific mortality within 10 years of uh, radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy. Um, it's been uh, validated in its role for uh, post-prostatectomy radiation therapy. It also has what we call what's called a decipher grid, and it's really an AI platform. It's also a database, and I, this is really in the movement here uh, from not just prognostic information, which is a lot of these tests already provide that, but it's a movement into actually predicting which ther therapies are going to be best for that individual based on the molecular classification of the cancer. So what is, what is the, the, the sensitivity and responsiveness to the antigen receptor and therefore response to ADT? What's the response to chemotherapy? What's it going to be to radiation therapy? That's really our move that we need to move to in prostate cancer management because that gets down to, the personif to personalizing it for an individual, not looking at um, at uh, population studies and looking at a number of other things, but we're looking at this in the individual themselves, how their cancer behaves based on the genomics and the genetics of their particular cancer. Um, um, so it's been helpful in, uh, in fact, they, they reported this out. Um, there is um, salvage radiation therapy, um, and they use what's called the PORTOS, which is the post-operative radiation therapy outcome score. So they combine that along with the, the grid score uh, to be able to provide additional information about who should receive radiation and who, and who doesn't. And again, it's that predictive model that we want to move towards, uh, and I think we're starting to get there. Um, Canary Pass is not a biomarker. Um, it's not really a test, but it is a, a calculator. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, uh, the prostate active um, surveillance study is, is, is PASS. Uh, this is a great kind of website. You can get onto it yourself and you can take a look. You can plug your numbers in. Uh, so again, this is, these are for men for active surveillance. Um, they look at the current risk in someone who's on active surveillance that they would, uh, that they would uh, need another biopsy or that they would progress. This is what it, it comes out to. You have a number of, of parameters, which includes age and um, uh, BMI. It looks at your PSA level. Um, it looks at all sorts of different parameters that you can simply plug in here on the sliding scale, and you can see where it'll give you a risk um, uh, uh, assessment uh, with regards to whether you would upgrade on the next biopsy and whether the biopsy is going to be indicated at that moment in time. So it's, again, it's a very useful tool uh, that, that uh, your, your physicians, your urologists can use as well as yourself and, and, and again, be your, be your, your, your best self-advocate for yourself. Circulating tumor DNA and tumor cells, CTC, CT DNA, uh, is really, I think, the up and coming uh, method to uh, truly identify uh, and um, um, quantify an individual's cancer and the risks. Um, uh, it's, uh, CTNA uses small kind of um, segments of DNA from tumors. You assess for the mutations. Uh, we look for these changes, the ep these epigenetic changes, such as methyl uh, methylation, and therefore it starts to give you in information on prognosis and also response predictions, right? That's what we're looking for. Quantity is going to be based on the tumor type and, and the stage and the PSA. Several of the currently available ones really are not, uh, not going to provide meaningful information until the PSAs are higher, usually uh, around 5 to 10. Um, um, circulating tumor cells themselves, um, at least being suggested uh, with regards to early diagnosis, prognosis assessment, prediction for treatment efficacy, and early detection of relapse. These are fairly complementary. Uh, right now, they're, being, they're really being used individually, one or the other, but perhaps in the future, they'll be used in a combined fashion. 
We also refer to these as liquid biopsies because you were, we're testing it from blood. You can get information from, from tissue. In fact, the earlier tests uh, were really tissue-based only, and that was fine if you had soft tissue, if you had visceral or organ metastasis, if you had lymph node. Much easier to get tissue from a soft tissue than it is from bone. Bone is very difficult. It's painful, you have to decalcify the material, and sometimes you don't get enough material uh, um, out of it. So those are the advantages, clearly, to a liquid biopsy. Uh, disadvantages, are, again, are going to be based on the amount of tumor that's available. If it's a very small amount, you may not, you may not find anything, you may not may pick it up. We still have some, some cost considerations here. We have insurance uh, uh, coverage. Uh, we certainly get much better coverage if someone is already in a castrate-resistant phase and they're metastatic. We can, we can look at it from that standpoint. We try to get it earlier, which the current thinking is that the genomics of the cancer probably aren't actually undergoing much change over time. Uh, whatever, you, whatever you begin with is kind of what you're set with. That's the current thinking. So if you actually did that test when the diagnosis was made, you get a, you get a clearer picture of what, how this cancer is going to behave. So again, we've got these, the, these drawbacks currently, but uh, I think as the technology develops, uh, we'll find that it's going to become less expensive as, as often is the case. Um, we can look at both germline and somatic mutations. Germline is the heritable uh, component of our DNA that we receive from our, our mothers and our fathers. Um, we have several tests available. Um, uh, Ambry has what's called cancer next, prostate next, and, and renal next, so they're actually getting now into renal uh, cancer as well for germline testing. Myriad makes my risk, and Vitae has their test. Um, um, Garden Foundation and Tempest are really the, the, the principal te current tests for somatic testing and liquid biopsies. They also provide it under, under tissue. Um, and um, then we have something relatively new uh, called Trinetra. Uh, it's you, that uh, where um, the um, uh, Garden Foundation and Tempest are, are principally using circulating tumor DNA. Trinetra is actually using uh, circulating tumor cells. Um, and they actually, actually just reported it out. Um, uh, they um, say that they can detect early stage prostate cancer at a greater than 99% accuracy with zero false positives. Currently indicated for 59 to 69 years of age with PSAs at least of three. FDA has given it a breakthrough des uh, device designation, which allows for speed up of development, assessment, and review. Uh, while they're still going through their processes of giving final review um, on that. Uh, so we'll, we'll get more information as time goes on. This is uh, uh, fairly well just off the presses uh, and uh, really hasn't hit the commercialization level yet. What do we have perhaps up and coming? Um, uh, we have what's called an epi switch. Um, um, which has been, been reported out of England. It combines uh, PSA with an epigenetic, their own epigenetic uh, epi-switch test. Um, they state, uh, and again, this is for screening, 94% accuracy for detection with a positive predictive value of 92% and negative predictive value of 94%. So that's in, in, in the screening uh, phase. Um, uh, another up and coming uh, is North Star Select and Response. Again, heading more towards this, uh, not only prognosis, but also prediction of, of response. So they'll look at tumor uh, 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 or mutation profiling, similar to the Garden, the Tempest, the, the Foundation One, but they also now have therapy response uh, monitoring. And again, they're looking at these epigenetic changes, such as methylation. Um, they're looking at single nucleotide variants as well as insertions and deletions. So these are changes that are going on within the genes themselves. And they, uh, they claim that they have a lower level of detection, two times lower than what the other tests are. So again, earlier identification, earlier change, is something happening? Do we need to start to think about doing something, whether this be imaging or change in, in therapeutics? And that's ultimately where we need to get to. Um, we have this multi-cancer early detection type test. It's also based on circulating tumor DNA. The best one known is the Galeri test. Uh, they claim that they can identify 50 plus tumor types. Um, in their own in, uh, literature, they say that it's not a diagnostic test as a standalone, but to be used uh, as a complement to existing cancer uh, screenings. It's supposed to predict where the cancer is coming from, from high accuracy. 
but if you look at the average sensitivity, okay, it's pretty low at 51%, and it's going to be based, and it's going to vary on the basis of what cancer type you're actually looking at. Uh, they claim that there's a false positive rate of less than 1%. Um, when you look at very early cancers, it didn't do very well. On the average, only about 16.8% of stage 1 cancers. So, again, failure to detect following a positive uh, multi-cancer early detection is really an issue. That is, you get a positive test, you go looking, you can't find it. What do you do? Uh, is that going to raise anxiety? Absolutely. Uh, how do you go through that? What do you do next? What's your interval for reassessment? All questions that have not been answered. Potential for unnecessary invasive tests. You go through a lot of things to try and find it. Um, you may uh, have a tendency to discontinue what we have as established screening studies as a result of this. Perhaps you get a negative test at this moment in time. I don't need to do anything more, and yet you should continue to evaluate. Um, potential of uh, overdiagnosis of slow growing or indolent type type cancers, cancers you don't have to worry about, you don't need to be be focused on. All right, so that's an overdiagnosis. And again, we don't simply don't know that if you come up with a positive test, does that really lead to improvement in living longer? I mean, that's probably that's really what we want, right? We want living longer, and we want living longer with quality. How does that impact that? Does it make a difference? Again, unknowns at this moment in time. So what do we have as unmet needs, all right? Um, if, you, if you go back to my first slide, remember I had a question mark under active surveillance, right? So a lot of us have been on active surveillance. A lot of us um, have progressed, unfortunately, from it. Um, how do we know that someone on active surveillance needs something more done? When's the next time to do the biopsy? Um, we need really a marker there, a biomarker, whether it be urine or it be blood, to really give us that additional information and not just based on PSA. Well, we currently lose PSA. We'll look at PSA doubling time. We'll look at PSA density by doing an MRI. You know, how often do we do MRIs? Do we really need to be doing them on an annual basis or can we do that? Do we really need to do a biopsy every two to three years, which is a lot of protocols currently follow, right? Uh, we want to reduce the frequency of unnecessary biopsies, do with the biopsy when, it's, when it is indicated necessary, and also try to cut down on the number of MRIs. Um, it's, an, it's, it's a time uh, consumption for patients. It's uncomfortable to be in the tunnel. Um, you have gadolinium, which you're receiving, which, of course, is a potential for gadolinium deposition and neurological issues from that standpoint. Um, so a lot of factors, biomarker, that's a, that's a need, Okay. Yes, it'd be great to have a better imaging study than an MRI. Uh, you know, we've done, we've done well here locally to in, in, increase our, our, our accuracy from that standpoint. It still remains expensive. There are a lot of our, a lot of our um, uh, fellow citizens that um, have difficulty getting it because of insurance uh, coverage. It could also perhaps even be in areas that are underserved, uh, especially in rural communities. How do you get it? How far do you need to go? A lot of factors. If you had something that was less expensive, more readily available, uh, provide better targeting, it certainly would be an, an assistance. Micro ultrasound, I'm not putting a plug into my office, believe me. I do think it's helpful. Um, I found it extremely helpful. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a number of studies that say that it really can compete head to head as a standalone to MRI. Um, there is a bit of a learning curve on being able to read MRIs because the, uh, the resolution is so much higher than standard ultrasound. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it could be, it, it certainly fit that, uh, fit that role uh, um, until something else perhaps better comes along. And then we have something for minimal residual disease, right? So we, we go through a therapy. Do I know that that therapy was effective? Did I eliminate all the cancer, either through radiation or, or through surgery? Um, it'd be nice to be able to say, hey, you've got something remaining. We need to do something more. We need some adjuvant type of therapy. It's not there yet. Been pretty well limited just to hematologic cancers. But uh, moving that on into other malignancies ap after therapy, uh, and that may just not simply be just due to definitive therapy. Let's say we've gone through um, uh, the cancer's progressed, we're now additional therapy. Are we really hitting the tumor effectively where it's at? We know that there's oligometastatic disease. We're using more and more focal therapy under that. Did we eliminate that? Did we reduce the counts? Great area. Uh, for the future that we could definitely uh, benefit from uh, additional testing for. Okay. So that's it. Um, <laughs> take questions. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, some, it, okay. I'll start. I'll, I'll work this way. So. Yeah, uh, I had COVID, and uh, a month after COVID, I took a PSA test, and and my PSA went up 50 percent. Have you seen any, any anything like that in your practice? Because it is an inflammatory. Right. Yeah. Um, I think I have. Uh, it's difficult to know. Uh, I haven't seen anything yet in the literature that really points to that. Uh, I think it's an interesting thought. Um, I think it um, probably needs to be looked at. Um, it's going to be perhaps a little more difficult now that we're kind of waning out of COVID and how many people are really getting it. I'm not really sure we're at that, at that point. Uh, but um, I've at least had a suspicion that it may be contributing to it. So we put the, we, we put the, uh, the individual onto a little closer monitoring and we see, take, take a look at that and see if we don't see a decline over time. And that uh, sort of ex post facto maybe tells us that that did seem to have a role. Yeah, I did do it six months later and it was a 30% decrease. Yeah, so you say, so again, perhaps some of the increase would have happened anyway and that 30% you know, was probably higher than where you were before, but perhaps uh, not as high as it would have been as a result of that inflammatory response, so sure. Thank you. Yeah. Presentation was excellent. First okay. rate, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I'm currently on dose of I, I'll, pay, I'll pay you something. <laughs> Free lunch. I'm currently on dose of toxal, dying to get off. It, it has a lot of side effects that I really don't appreciate. And I want to get over, over on to Plovecto, LU-177. I understand there's a shortage, because it's made in Italy, of all places. And right. I guess they have a supply chain problem. Yep. Is all this true? Do you have a prediction as to when it will be back? into our realm here yeah I, I i wish i could give you a date that's what i heard i just actually just found that out a couple of days ago um you know supply chain you know you guys are probably have a lot of experience with that in 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 in, in business it's affected everything for us um it's uh it's tragic unfortunately but it is it is what it is uh, and so, do I have any information on when it's going to become available? Unfortunately, no. Gene, you got something? Uh, I can add something to that. I think I think that it's getting better. Uh, my last treatment six months, uh, six weeks ago, well, I got my treatment delayed because of that. The treatment I'm going to have Monday is not being delayed, so I think it's getting better. So recheck often to find out. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I just, <clears throat> we've seen uh, people talk, talk about scans and how sometimes those could be misinterpreted. There's a certain error rate. What about if you're just standard type biopsies? Are those pretty clear cut to interpret? Um, kind of, I, I kind of depends on what the, what you're focusing on in terms of interpretation, okay? If you're, if you're looking from the pathologic perspective, yes, there, I mean, there are still some that are, are equivocal. And despite having all the histochemical uh, dyes and evaluation, sometimes you still come up, you're not really certain about it. When it comes to actually imaging and targeting doing the biopsies, we've gotten much, much better. Um, certainly the advent of MRI fusion has, has been, has been uh, a great boon to us uh, to uh, try to identify where the cancer is located, if, it's, if, if indeed it's there. Um, you, you saw in terms of MRIs, um, either negative predictive value, a little bit better here, here locally, uh, but you're still having about a 20% uh, false negative rate. So the MRI itself is not going to show them the, 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 the site of the tumor, and yet it's still there. So we're looking again for complementary information, right? So we're going to look at using some of those biomarkers that may say, okay, I've got that MRI that isn't showing me anything, and yet the, uh, the biomarker is telling me I'm at a higher risk. So perhaps you start to think about a micro ultrasound or, or a biopsy that's done in a saturation fashion. That's another thing that some places will do from that standpoint. But when you, again, you are using complementary uh, technology, so you have MRI. In my, in my practice, I have micro ultrasound, which I think has been really a significant improvement over standard ultrasound. It's an expensive system. Not every office can have it. But um, when you add that to MRI, uh, my accuracy is really picked up. 
The other thing that that allows you to do is be able then to say, I can correlate the MRI image and abnormality with the micro ultrasound. And perhaps now this is a situation that might be amenable to focal therapy because you can actually see it. And since you're not, since there, there is a technique to treat uh, prostate cancer focally uh, with MRI, that's the Tulsa uh, uh, procedure, but we can also uh, do it with interstitial laser. We could also do it in other ways that, that the ultrasound itself can identify the tumor and be more accurate in its treatment. So I think we've certainly gotten better and better. Perhaps some future imaging will even be more precise on that basis of it. But I think we've, I, we've certainly come a long way since 31 years ago when I started my residency, or when I finished my residency, actually. In the last two meetings, we've tried to emphasize the RSI MRI, and you've mentioned it today, too. I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But I would ask, are there situations when you tell somebody, just get an ordinary MRI, or do you want all MRIs to be RSI MRI now? Uh, from a purely selfish perspective, I would like it all to be RSI, okay? I would like everybody to go to IHS. Uh, in the first place, okay, I, I, I trust the reader, okay? I, again, there's a lot of inter-operator um, variability, okay, and you'll see that. Um, so I, I, I trust the folks over at IHS, okay? Secondly, I have access to the images myself, right? I have, I have their portal, I can get on, I can look at their images. I can't do that in the major hospital systems myself. I need a disc, which is far more difficult to, to manipulate the imaging. It's also um, not certain which images I'm going to get. Am I getting the right ones that, 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 I, that I want to be able to do the interpretation myself and be able to put that information, for example, into the Fusion software uh, that we use? So for all of the above reasons, um, I think IHS is the best. but. We still have insurance issues, we still have coverage issues, we have a number of things that may prevent that from happening. I also have, you know, older individuals who don't want to travel all the way to La Jolla. Uh, and, 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 you know, and I get it. Uh, they may have limitations, they don't have family members. Uh, maybe they don't, they don't drive themselves. So there's a number of factors that are legitimate that makes it more difficult. But, you know, if I were king, I would wave my, you know, my, my regal scepter and say, MRI is always at IHS. I, I don't think maybe Ross wouldn't like it. They'd be overwhelmed, but it's, it, it is what it is. So. Over here. Okay. Um, what about uh, we heard so many uh, we heard so many good things about PSMA. Why not make that uh, a standard thing for everybody? Or, or, that, or is it that the PSMA uh, just tells you that there's cancer, but not exactly where? Or? Oh, no, oh no, it's, it's it's very good for isolating it. But you know, at, at a cash price of $4,500, you think Medicare is going to cover something like that for every single individual? No, it's not gonna happen. The current indications are for rising PSA you know, after, uh, or, with, or with the diagnosis of high-risk prostate cancer, but not certainly from a screening perspective, at least not yet. But you know, the idea, I think, is sound that if you have a uh, have another technique to superimpose on existing ones, you're going to be much more accurate in localizing it. But keep in mind also that probably somewhere around 10% of prostate cancer does not express PSMA. Okay? So you still got a 10% risk there, roughly, might be a little bit higher, a little lower, that it's not going to be beneficial from that standpoint, too. So that's what you're about. My question is uh, this RSI MRI, is it? Uh, primarily suitable for uh, doing uh, primary diagnosis, or is it also useful for stage four metastatic prostate cancer? I can't answer that question, Larry. I don't know about, about the latter half of it. We certainly are using it to, to, uh, to screen, uh, do a secondary screen for elevated PSA. Uh, but I don't know how, how that works in other circumstances. So keep in mind, I'm, I'm a urologist and I'm not a radiologist, but uh, it's an interesting question, but i sorry I don't have the, the answer to it. Yeah, so my understanding is that uh, once you've been treated, that uh, things get a little mushy in the prostate and it's a little, it might be a little harder to use either uh, DWI or RSI 
to to know that's cancer there is that kind of what you're saying is that we don't know that yet we don't yes i mean it, and, and looking at individuals who we that i biopsy for recur uh, for potential recurrent disease within the prostate after radiation therapy radiation therapy really causes a lot of change and that's actually quite challenging to the radiologist actually to be able to interpret that you can get some ideas on that on, on that basis of it but it makes more difficult and in fact, you really, you really can't even use the PIRADS um, a scale on someone who's had radiation. It should, it's, it's no longer valid. So you're really looking at, at, at other changes, morphologic changes, with, uh, or uh, other density changes within the tissue to kind of to help you on that basis. So, Yes? Can you say No, uh, not, not behind you. I'm sorry. Uh, got, hello. Hello. Right, right, right. Um, okay. okay. I'll, I'm, for, you're next. I guarantee you. For, for uh, patients undergoing ADT after uh, recurrence from uh, surgery and uh, radiation. What would you suggest as, the, as a reasonable test uh, regimen? Is it just PSA or do you have any other tests that you take and what frequency? Yeah, um, if you, on, active, uh, on active ADT, um, if you're on a typically a three month Interval. I'll be checking PSA, but I'll check testosterone as well, uh, since some of the um, the antagonists, which is the most uh, or agonists rather, GnRH agonists, are the most commonly used. We can certainly see testosterone escape with that. So always check a testosterone. I always check a um, complete metabolic panel. Uh, it gives me information about general health factors, renal function, um, liver function tests, uh, um, glucose, because unfortunately we know that. ADT tends to be um, uh, fostering diabetes or uh, poor glucose uh, metabolism. So all of that is what I do on a routine basis uh, for my patients, uh, and that's been quite quite helpful. Periodically, I'll throw a CDC in, uh, since we know that um, there can be some effects on ADT on blood counts as well. We'll do lipids periodically as well. I don't do it on a, a, every single individual uh, routinely. Um, much also depends on what the insurance is going to is going to bear and what it's going to cover for these tests. If you have a diagnosis already of um, hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, uh, you can get a you can get a cholesterol level uh, uh, pretty routinely. Uh, if you don't have that kind of a diagnosis, it may not be covered by the insurance. But a CMP typically would always be covered. So at least we get a little like, we get some information from that standpoint. But that's how I manage my patients on ADT. Okay. And obviously, if they're on intermittent ADT, I want to make sure I want to see what happens after the discontinuation uh, when they're on the holiday. Uh, I want to see how quickly that testosterone level is recovering. I want to see what PSA response is from that standpoint to make a decision when we're going to use it again. So we're going to use all that information and, and, and engage our patients uh, to the best we can. You're next. Thank you. Um, and I'm also one of your patients. You, you did a uh, biopsy on me several months ago. But I'm hearing it. And you're here. That's great. And I'm here. That's so good. I also, in 45 minutes, have an MP MRI, and I'm wondering how that uh, differs from the IHS that you said was maybe the best. Same thing. It's actually, it's actually the same thing. So a multi-parametric MRI is going to be looking at multiple parameters in terms of adjustments, how they do that. And they're over, overlying this um, on cue prostate uh, 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 as well as the RSI information to help them interpret it. But they're one, one and the same. So you, you, you get the Benny here at IHS from all those other in, in interpretive aids, which is what the RSI and the on cue prostate um, artificial intelligence program uh, does uh, with that. But it's a multi parametric MRI. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a uh, three-part question, if I may. Okay. Uh, you showed the slides of various protocols, uh, PSA, MRI, uh, biopsy. I'm wondering how many uh, institutions, at least in this Southern California area, uh, stay with the first option of PSA, MRI, biopsy. Uh, second part is... Let's, let's, let's take them one, if you haven't written down, let's take them one at a time, because I probably won't remember. So if I understand the question correctly, how often do we... But what percentage of institutions locally? Um, oh, it's a, it's a, I'm going to guess maybe currently 20%. Okay. Um, 
There's a lot of factors that come into play with that. Sure. Uh, where's the PSA, right? Who's the individual, and where, they're, where is their PSA? It, you know, if, if your PSA is um, 3.5 and their exam is normal and there's no family history, but yet it's based on age, um, and we have a discussion, and that's the informed discussion that that patient and I have, we may choose to do an MRI at that point. We may choose to do a biomarker at that point. So, but some percentage is going to go ahead and say, let's just do the MRI and let's take a look and see what we have from that standpoint. But those other factors that have to come into it, that's different from a PSA of say 12, okay? Uh, if the, in the prior PSA was maybe two years ago and it was six, well, it's doubled in that length of time. Um, I'm thinking more probably that there's a biopsy that's probably going to be needed. I don't know if a biomarker is really going to help me, so I'm going to probably go into the MRI at that moment in time, right? So that's why it can vary a little bit from that. So, but tough to give you an exact percentage of how many. Uh, I'm wondering how many uh, cancers are diagnosed initially as metastasized. I, I did, how often is it is it metastasized at first diagnosis? Oh my goodness. Um, I give you a percentage. I mean, it clearly, unfortunately, has, in, has increased significantly. I mean, I'll tell you that probably at least five patients per month I see that are that already presenting to me with metastasis. And that all, I think, comes from the lack of PSA uh, appropriate screening uh, at, the, at the primary care level uh, before they actually come to see us. So that, that continually keeps going up and up, unfortunately. And the last part. Uh, some centers are identified as centers of excellence. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, there's going to be um, the general urology office uh, where you have a, um, a urologist like I used to do that would handle, take care of prostate cancer, and then you have groups like mine who have then dedicated resources, uh, both from physician and also ancillary staff that focus only on prostate cancer. So you become, um, you develop expertise in terms of helping patients navigate their diagnosis from screening, diagnosis, having the availability of a fusion biopsy platforms to increase the accuracy of, of biopsies. Um, and micro everything that, hmm? yeah. The micro ultrasound. Micro ultrasound, right. Um, you, for example, our protocol is before a biopsy, uh, we offer every patient to have a rectal swab performed to look for sensitivities and of, their, of their colonic flora so we can know which antibiotics to use. It's amazing how many times we actually find individuals now with multiple resistant forms of bacteria. Uh, if I gave them just a standard cocktail, uh, which in many places is only a single antibiotic still, your risk of sepsis goes up dramatically. Um, so, and in fact, you can see some of them, they're like, you know, 6% sepsis rates. I mean, we're nowhere near that. Why? Because again, we, we take these precautions. But, I have, but the center, the office has to have that, uh, that ability to be able to do that. So my staff have to be trained on how to do that. Uh, I have someone trained to be able to interpret that, uh, to select the antibiotics uh, that we're going to use. We do dual antibiotics, both oral and, um, and, and a parenteral as an injection. So we have that. We have staff that know how to obtain authorizations for our patients for the medications. Right? These medications are incredibly expensive. Right? You're looking at some of the novel hormonal agents that if you, if you were out of pocket, you'd be ten to $12,000 per month. Okay? Right? So you have, to have, you have to have a staff that's well versed on how to navigate to look for foundations and other avenues to help patients. The amount of paperwork is, is, is enormous what it takes. A, a general urologist's office can't begin to handle that, okay? Um, we have an office that is dedicated to, to, to men, and we dedicate the time to them. So my new patient appointments right now are hourly. So I, I dedicate a whole time of an hour to prepare, see, review, and talk to the patient and get everything set up. You can't do that in a general urology office. I mean, if you're seeing 40 patients a day, you've got 10 minutes per patient. Right, and that's the that's the unfortunate reality of business nowadays, and how medicine is practiced in this country. So that's how you can start to identify a center of a, a center of excellence or expertise 
that can provide that kind of level of care for, for someone. They may not offer every single therapeutic known, known to man or woman, but you're gonna have a lot of that and you're gonna have that focused care. That's, I think, what makes the, makes the market better. Thank you. Um, thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. Um, no question, just a, just a comment at this time. You've been my doctor for about five years now, and I really appreciate the great care and service I'm getting from you. You take the, the time, and that's, like you just mentioned, you take time out of your day to uh, talk to me about my situation and really appreciate your, your care and treatments I've been getting and the dentist's health care in general. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I did not pay him anything, okay? So, <laughs> so, so thank you. Unsolicited, thank you so much. Very kind, appreciate that. Humbly. Thanks, I enjoyed the uh, presentation today. I have a question here. Uh, uh, a little over a year ago, I had a uh, pet F8, F18. Axiomen, you know what the Axiomen one? Okay. The one that was before the PSMA approved. And uh, I uh, presented uh, just a few weeks ago to uh, uh, a group up in the LA area to look at, I even have the disc here now. And one of the comments was uh, that they didn't see the extra uh, from the capsule, uh, out of the capsule, but it says, we reviewed the images, but not did, but did not have good fusion images. My question is, I did really point down to these people. What what do you mean by the fusion? Maybe you could define why they say that this disc that I got and, and presented to them uh, over a year ago, they didn't do the, the procedure there. It was another uh, company did the uh, 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 images, right. uh, the fusion. Uh, Problem. Difficult question to answer because I'm not really certain what they're referring there. It's a yeah. bit of speculation. But let me just say that um, PET CT uses CT imaging, okay, right. uh, as its modality, right? Mm -hmm. And CTs don't do a terribly good job at fine right. detail in the periphery of tissues. It's, it's, it's relatively gross, yeah. okay, relative to an MRI. Uh, and so it, you may see activity within the prostate, for example. You're not certain whether, you know, how close to the capsule is this? Is it, you know, microscopic outside? Is it grossly outside? It can be difficult to tell. Clearly, there are extremes. You can say, okay, look, this large, bulky disease. We know it's outside the prostate. There's no question about it. So they may be referring to the fact that they didn't have any MRI information to try to correlate those, that information of the activity to what the MRI showed. I would, I'm, I'm speculating, I think that's probably what they were referring to in that particular case. Uh, but well, that's the only thing that really right. makes sense to me. Moss wasn't the one that did this oxygen, but I, I had, uh, I had a, uh, an MRI with him. He's an expert guy back in 2016, so it's a while ago when I had an MRI with Right, but, Ross, but, but when, when they read your PET, they, they may not have had the MRI. I don't, I, 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 So let's follow up with that one afterwards. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, Doctor, for your presentation today. Uh, it's been hugely eye-opening for me. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, what does, um, who, who is IHS? Can you? Imaging Healthcare Specialists. Uh, they're uh, a, um, a company uh, locally that does um, um, diagnostic imaging. Um, they also do, they also have interventional radiology, so they're able to, to do biopsies. Uh, for example, they can do MRI-directed prostate biopsies, but they'll do other type of, of uh, um, uh, in, interventions for biopsy of soft tissue uh, disease and, and sites and so forth. So. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, my second question has to do with my own, where I am in my journey with prostate cancer. Maybe you can say that for Okay. Okay. We have somebody over here. Thank you. Just tacking on to the first question about uh, the PSA test at post-COVID, um, have you, in your experience with PSA testing, seen um, changes, meaning going down, the numbers going down, uh, 
whether by changing from labs, is there a difference, or do all labs use a standard test for PSA and it's fairly accuracy? They, they, they don't use, they don't all, all use the same assay, so they, they will use different assays. They also report out different levels of what they consider to be um, undetectable. Um, you know, I've seen some at less than 0.2, um, less than 0.1. You can certainly do what's called an ultra-sensitive PSA, so you're actually going to get down much, much lower. Some ultra-sensitives will put it down into the hundreds place, so you've got a 0 0.0 something. And then there's some that will report out less than 0 0.0006. So it really is a little bit all over, all over the map from that standpoint. Um, so, but yeah, it, there's differences in, in, in the assay and how they report it out. One or two more questions. Are there any questions? Or we should wrap it up and go munch and chat some more. All right.